Hello, uh, we have been discussing the failure analysis of laminate and in our last class we have actually discussed how to calculate the first supply failure load of a laminate. We understood with the help of an example and uh, today uh, in continuation to that today we shall discuss uh, the high growth thermomechanical analysis of laminate. That means what happens if a laminate is simultaneously subjected to mechanical load as well as thermal load as well as uh, hygroscopic load. Okay. So, uh, we will try to understand this with the help of an example even though uh, in our uh, previous lectures we have understood what uh, how the hygrothermal residual stresses are actually induced in different lamina of a laminate and in our last class we understood how to determine the first ply failure load of a laminate subjected to mechanical loading. So, today we will try to see how the combined uh, I mean when a laminate is actually subjected to both hygrothermo mechanical loading how do we do the failure analysis. Okay. So, we have taken an example that example is to determine the first ply failure load of a uh, laminate under thermal gradient of 50 degree Celsius. That means, we have a laminate the stacking sequence of the laminate is given this is a glass epoxy laminate this is a glass epoxy laminate and with the stacking sequence of 0 plus minus 45 90 symmetric I think you know what kind of laminate it is I mean just a passing remark this is a quasi isotropic laminate. So, altogether there are 8 layers in this laminate. Okay. There are 8 layers in this laminate and it is a symmetric laminate. So, suppose this is the laminate uh, which is having a mid plane and this is symmetric with reference to the mid plane <coughs> sorry. So, suppose this is subjected to N x okay. this is subjected to only N x. So, we know how to determine the first ply failure load. Okay that we have seen in our last class how to determine the first ply failure load. So, here we need to determine the first ply failure load when this laminate is experiencing a delta T is equal to 50 degree Celsius. So, we will approach this problem as two individual problem first uh, we will find out the first ply failure load without having any uh, temperature thermal gradient or temperature gradient delta T and then we will in, uh, see separately what happens if there is a uh, delta T and then we analyze how the first ply failure load gets influenced because of the presence of delta T. So, to start with we will I think we have discussed these steps, but again the laminate stacking sequence is given and for this is a glass epoxy lamina and for each lamina the lamina properties that means, the engineering constants e 1 e 2 nu 1 to g 1 2 is given. So, from this we can determine the reduced we can determine the reduced stiffness matrix. Okay. So, we can calculate the reduced stiffness matrix you know the formula in terms of the engineering constants. So, for an unidirectional glass epoxy lamina this is the reduced transform uh, trans reduced stiffness matrix. Okay. Next what we do is next step is we have discussed these step, steps in details we determine the reduced transform stiffness matrix Q bar for all the layers. Okay. In this case there are 8 layers therefore, for all the 8 layers or for all the 8 lamina we determine Q bar K reduced transform stiffness matrix. How? 
we know that this reduced transform stiffness matrix for any lamina is actually a function of the reduced stiffness matrix and its fiber orientation angle. We have this transformation, we have the formula. Therefore, we could find out the Q bar for all the layers here. Here we have 8 layers 0 plus 45 minus 45 90 symmetric therefore 90 minus 45 plus 45 0. So, for all these 8 layers we could find out the Q bar okay. this is for the 0 degree layer, this is for the plus 45 minus 45 and the 90 degree layer. Okay. So, we have once we calculate the Q bar matrix, then so having calculated the Q bar matrix for each layer or each ply, having calculated the Q bar layer for each ply and having known the values of Z k and Z k minus 1, we can now calculate, we can now calculate a, b and d matrix. We have discussed this number of times. So, therefore, it is pretty straightforward. Okay. We have the expressions for a, b and d. So, all these information are known. Therefore, in this case, we get a as this. Please take care of the unit. So, this is g p a millimeter and we can immediately calculate a inverse and Having calculated the A inverse, uh, we could determine the effective effective Young's modulus of the laminate, effective Young's modulus in extension, okay, where H is the thickness of the laminate A 1 1 star is the first element of the inverse of A. This is A 1 1 star. Similarly, this A 2 2 star like A, A 1 2 star A 2 2 star. Now, note that actually you can calculate B matrix and D matrix also, but because it is symmetric we know that B will be 0 because it is a symmetric laminate and we can also calculate D but since it is a uh, our objective is to determine the first ply failure load when the laminate is subjected to only normal for normal load n x and it is symmetric therefore, D matrix is not required we do not need to determine the curvature. Okay. Therefore, D matrix, but we can still calculate in general we will actually calculate all the A, B and D matrix okay. and having known A, B, B, D matrix and having known the force okay the force resultant and moment resultant okay now in this case we have considered we have considered nx equal to 100 newton per millimeter okay you can even consider nx equal to 1 newton per millimeter okay and then so having known this we can use this relationship and from this we can determine the mid surface strains and curvatures by taking inverse of A B B D and this forces and moments are known. In this case, in this particular problem, in this problem, because we wanted to find out first ply failure load in X, so all other forces are 0. Okay. 
also b is equal to 0 and you will appreciate that because it is a symmetric laminate subjected to n x there will not be any curvature. Okay. So, we can determine the mid surface strains. So, here we can we have determined the mid surface strains like this. I mean in this particular case we even do not have to take the A inverse because it is a simple n x is the only non zero therefore, by solving these equations you can find out, but in general we will find out the mid surface strains and curvatures using A B B D inverse. Okay. In this particular case k x equal to 0, k y also equal to 0, k x y is also equal to 0. Okay. No curvature because coupling is not there, it is a symmetric matrix okay. because it is symmetric. Symmetric laminate and only n x is applied therefore, there is no curvature. So, we, we calculated the mid surface strains and curvatures. Now, using mid surface strains and curvatures, we could determine we could determine the strains in all the layers all the plies or layers how using epsilon x epsilon y gamma xy is equal to epsilon x naught, epsilon y naught, gamma x y naught plus z into k x, k y, k x y. In this case, in this case, because k x, k y, k x y is 0 implies that strains in all the layers in all the plies strains in all the plies in global coordinates that means in x y are same as the mid surface strains. But in general it may not be so. So, we can find out actually the strains in all the layers using this formula. This is the general formula where k is in this case n is equal to 8. So, in all the 8 layers we can find out the strains, but in this particular problem because it is a symmetric laminate and only subjected to n x therefore, there is no curvature and hence the strain in the global axis x y strains in the global axis x y is in all the layers are same as that of the mid surface strains. Okay. So, knowing the uh, strains in all the layers okay, therefore, we now know the we know the epsilon x epsilon y gamma x y for all the layers or plies okay for all the plies are known and then knowing this we can now calculate we can calculate the material axis strain
in all the plies using this formula using this strain transformation okay because we know that theta k for each ply we know what is the fiber orientation angle and therefore we know the transformation matrix and using that we could determine the strains in the material axis in all the plies okay now in this particular case there are eight plies okay four above the middle surface and four below it okay and they are symmetric so the first layer is 0 degree second layer is 45 degree third layer is minus 45 degree fourth layer is 90 degree and it is symmetric fifth layer is again 90 Sixth is minus forty-five, seventh is forty-five, and eighth is again zero degree. So in each of these layers, we know the strains in the material axis. Okay. So we, we now calculate the strains in the material axis how using this formula. Okay. Therefore, in the first and eighth layer, which are zero degree layers, these are the strains. Of course, you can see that these are the same as x y because zero degree means the principal material directions do coincide with the global axis therefore it is same as epsilon x epsilon y and gamma x y and then in the 45 degree layers these are the material axis strains so we can calculate and minus 45 degree layers which is the third and sixth layer these are the material axis strains and in the 90 degree layers which are the fourth and fifth layers this is these are the material axis strains and you can also see from this calculations that in the 0 and 90 degree layers there is no shear strain because these are special orthotropic lamina therefore there is no shear extension coupling on the other hand for the plus and minus 45 degree layers there are shear strains even though it is subjected to only nx because of this uh, it's an angle lamina therefore there is shear extension coupling so there are shear strains in plus and minus 45 degree lamina anyway so we could now determine the material axis strains in all the layers therefore from the material axis strains we can now calculate the stresses in the material axis in each ply okay so how by we know that by multiplying by the reduced stiffness matrix we can sorry by multiplying with the reduced stiffness matrix the material axis strains could be converted to corresponding material axis stresses okay so for all these layers we could find out say for this first and eighth layers which are zero degree layers what is the stress sigma 1 is 202.97 mega pascal sigma 2 is minus 0.6 0.46 and of course shear stress is zero now you have to understand what exactly this means that this layer this is zero degree layer okay Zero degree means its x y actually coincides with one two. Now this is one, and this is two. Okay, material axis. Now what is the stress here? Sigma one is two hundred two point nine seven mega pascal, and sigma two is minus very small point four six mega pascal. Okay, and there is no tau x y. Okay, tau one two. tau 1 to is 0 okay now we know a lamina could fail in five probable failure modes what are those longitudinal tensile longitudinal compressive transverse tensile transverse compressive and in plane shear now in this particular case the longitudinal stress induced is 202 that means this is positive 
So, what is the corresponding strength? Because it is positive, therefore, the corresponding strength is longitudinal tensile strength sigma 1 T u, okay, whose value is given for this unidirectional glass epoxy is 1062 mega Pascal. Had this sigma 1 been negative, the corresponding strength would have been sigma 1 C u, that is the longitudinal compression strength. Okay. Similarly, sigma 2 is negative. Okay. Therefore, the corresponding strength is sigma 2 C u, which is minus 118 mega Pascal. Okay. And of course, tau 1 2 is 0. Now, for this particular lamina, 0 degree lamina, in the longitudinal mode, how far it is away from the failure is given by the strength ratio. That means, stress by the corresponding strength, in this case, it is longitudinal tensile okay? and the strength ratio is 0 0.19. What is the significance of strength ratio? If it is 1, that means, it fails in that particular mode. Okay? Similarly, strength ratio in transverse compression is 0, 0, 0.039 and of course, there is no shear, therefore, it is 0. So, in the same way, we could calculate the material axis strains, uh, stresses in all the layers and depending upon the sign of those stresses, we could determine the corresponding strength ratios. Okay. Again, in the plus 45 degree layers, you can see sigma 1 and sigma 2 are both positive and therefore, the corresponding strength ratio is the corresponding strengths are sigma 1 T u and sigma 2 T u. Like in this case, this is a 45 degree layer. Okay. So, this is 1, this is 2. Now, 1 is sigma 1, this is 79.37. Therefore, the corresponding strength is sigma 1 T u, which is 1062 mega Pascal. And sigma 2 is sigma 2 is also positive 20.29 okay, mega Pascal. And the corresponding strength will be because it is positive sigma 2 T u okay? and sigma 2 T u is 31 mega Pascal. You know that the transverse tensile strength is very poor. Okay? So, therefore, accordingly we could determine the strength ratio for each possible modes. Okay? Here unlike the 0 degree layer, here shear is also there. Therefore, and you know that in the material axis, the sign of shear does not have any significance. Therefore, the strength ratio in shear is the shear stress divided by the corresponding shear strength. So, in the same way, we could calculate for the minus 45 also the strength ratios and for 90 degree also. Okay. So, we obtain the strength ratios for all the possible modes. Okay. Now, having known these strength ratios, we now tabulate the strength ratios. Okay, for all the plies. Please see that there are actually 8 plies, but we have tabulated only 4. You can tabulate the other 4 also, because it is symmetric, it will be exactly same. The stresses will also be exactly same. Okay. 6 is, this is minus 45, 6 is minus 45, okay. 7 is 45, 8 is 0. So, exactly same, the stresses will be exactly same and so, and so will be the strength ratios. Now, what we have done here is, we have first plotted sigma 1, sigma 2, tau 1, 2 and the corresponding strength ratios in longitudinal, in transverse and in shear. And for this 0 degree layer, we could, we have compared all the strength ratios and we could see that this is the, among these 3, strength ratio is longitudinal tens, uh, transverse and shear, this is the highest among these three. Therefore, if the, uh, the 0 degree layer fails, it will fail in this mode longitudinal tensile. Similarly, we have done for 45 and we have also done for minus 45 and for 90 degree. Okay. So, for each of this uh, lamina, each of this ply, we could obtain the strength ratio in the possible modes of failure. Okay. Now, having known that the 
the strength ratios actually indicate how far that particular mode of failure is. Therefore, the highest strength ratio among all these will be the first to reach failure. You know what does it mean? That means all the strength ratios are corresponding to all the strength ratios are actually these are corresponding to we have arbitrarily taken a load corresponding to what we have taken n x equal to 100 Newton per millimeter. And if strength ratio is 1 that means it has failed. Okay. Now, in this case only this is this strength ratio is highest and it is more than 1. Okay. That means, subjected to n x this 90 degree layers will fail in transverse tensile mode, because this is where the strength ratio will reach 1 first. Okay. Now, already corresponding to 100 it is 1.3242. Therefore, at what load this will be 1 could be calculated using this. Okay. Therefore, uh, n x at which the 90 degree plies will fail meaning s r is equal to 1 in transverse tensile is given by this corresponding to 100 it is 1.3242 therefore uh, what will be the value of n x if uh, if this has to be 1. So, we get this is the first ply this is the load at which this will this 90 degree ply will fail among these 8 plies 2 90 degree plies will fail first in transverse tensile and therefore, this is the first ply failure load. This we have done earlier also. Okay. So, it is pretty straightforward. Now, our problem here was to determine the first ply failure load when this particular laminate is actually experiencing a delta t of 50 degree Celsius. Therefore, what we do is now we treat this as a separate problem this laminate is subjected to delta t is equal to 50 degree Celsius and therefore, we would like to determine for due to this delta t is equal to 50 degree Celsius what are the residual stresses induced in each ply of this lamina. We have done it earlier. So, following the same procedure we will uh, first we determine the for each layer we determine for each ply the coefficient of thermal expansion in the global axis. Okay. How we know that the coefficient of thermal expansion in the material direction is known and they follow the same transformation as that of strain strain. Therefore, using strain transformation we could obtain the coefficient of thermal expansions in x y for each ply and we have calculated this okay. given sigma alpha 1 alpha 2 we could calculate for 0 degree 45 degree minus 45 degree and 90 degree. Okay. So, having known this alpha x alpha y alpha x y for each layer we could now determine the equivalent equivalent thermal load and moments due to Now, it is a symmetric laminate therefore, there will be no moment, but just for the sake of completeness we have shown that this is what the equivalent thermal load and moment comes out to be 0 anyway. Okay. So, once we know the equivalent thermal forces and moments we can now use this load strain relationship I mean force moment and strain curvature relationship through ABBD matrix. Okay. And from this putting the values of equivalent thermal loads n x n y 
and next we could calculate the mid surface strains and of course, the again it is a symmetric laminate therefore, curvature will be 0 just for the sake of completeness we have shown the whole thing here. Therefore, we obtained the mid surface strains due to delta t and this is anyway 0 this is curvature due to in this case it is 0 okay, because it is a symmetric laminate. So, we have determined the mid surface strains due to delta t and we can now determine the strains in all the layers using this formula again because there is no curvature therefore, strains in all the layers in the global axis x y will be same as that of the mid surface strains. Okay. Therefore, strains in all the layers in the global axis x y due to delta t is equal to 50 degree Celsius is listed here okay. epsilon x epsilon y as uh, it is obvious for 0 and 90 degree layer there is no gamma x y okay, because there is no shear extension coupling, but for the 45 and minus 45 there is gamma x y. Okay. We have obtained this mid surface strains due to delta t as you can see that there is no gamma x y. Okay. The reason is this is actually a quasi isotropic laminate okay. therefore, subjected to n x there is no gamma x y okay. and uh, therefore, now having known this, uh, this mid surface strains we could find out the strains in all the layers okay. and because the curvature is 0 therefore, the strains in all the layers is same as that of the mid surface strains. Okay. So, we have tabulated these strains in all the layers in the global axis x y and now these are the common strains. Okay. What, what does it mean? That means, uh, all the layers will experience the same strains okay, in x and y directions, but suppose each of these individual layers are actually uh, subjected to delta t they would have experienced different strains because it is called free thermal strain. Now, uh, because there is no constraint, but now all the layers are actually adjacent layers are actually having perfect bonding with the adjacent layers. All the layers are actually perfectly bonded with the adjacent layers. Okay. Therefore, they are not allowed to uh, experience free thermal strain okay. that there is a constraint. The difference between the free thermal strain and the common strain is nothing but the residual strain in each layer. We have discussed this earlier also. Therefore, the free thermal strains in x y coordinates are actually calculated as delta t into alpha. Okay. So, these are the free thermal strains and the difference between the free thermal strain and the common strain is the residual strains. Therefore, the residual strains in each ply is now obtained by subtracting the free thermal strains from the common strain okay. and these are also tabulated here. So, these are the residual strains. Okay. Then once we have the residual strains we can now calculate the residual stresses okay, in each ply. So, the residual stresses are calculated by multiplying the residual stra strains with the reduce transform stiffness matrix for that particular ply and this is how we tabulate the residual stresses in the global x y coordinate. Okay. And once we have the residual stresses we could now calculate the residual stresses in the material axis okay. just by using the stress transformation in each ply we could now calculate the residual stresses in material axis. So, these are the residual stresses in the material axis of each ply. So, now because of delta t this is solely due to delta t. Okay. Now, because of delta t we could obtain the residual stresses. Okay. Now, our, our problem was to determine the first ply failure load or rather to understand the influence of delta t on the first ply failure load. Now, if you remember when we have taken 100 Newton per millimeter as n x, okay, what was the stress? The 
possible mode of failure was the transverse tensile in the 90 degree layer. Okay, the 90 degree layer would have failed first in the transverse tensile mo mode, and the stress is 90 degree layer was 41.1 mil uh, mega Pascal. So suppose in addition to this 100 Newton per millimeter n x, this laminate is now also experiencing delta two is equal to delta t is equal to 50 degree Celsius. Then there is an additional stress, but this is compressive of minus 4.21. Therefore, the total stress in the 90 degree layer in the transverse direction is given by this. So, there is a net decrease in the total stress in the transverse direction of the 90 degree layer. Now, to determine the first ply failure load, there are two components one is sigma 2 due to n x, another is sigma 2 because of delta t, which is the residual stress. Okay. Now, this residual component of residual thermal stress is due to delta t is equal to 50 degree and it does not change with n x, it is independent of n x. On the other hand, the delta 2 due to n x varies linearly with n x, is not it? Because of 100 it is 41, if we make it 200 it will be 82 like that. Therefore, the condition for failure is that the total stress sigma 2 due to n x and due to residual thermal is equal to the sigma t 2 u that means the ultimate transverse tensile stress which is 31 MPa. Okay. Okay. Therefore, since for delta t is equal to 50, this is constant. Therefore, the sigma 2 due to n x required for this failure to occur, this failure condition to occur is given by this. Okay. That means, 31 plus this, this is minus 4.21. Therefore, it must be 35.21 mega Pascal. Now, corresponding to n x equal to 100, sigma 2 is equal to 41.1. Therefore, we need to now find out for what value of n x this becomes 35. Therefore, n x the value value of n x for which this becomes 35.21 is would be calculated like this. Therefore, this is the first ply failure load. Now, we can clearly see here that because of the presence of delta t the first ply failure load has increased from 75.5 to 85.67. because the delta t is equal to 50 degree Celsius actually leads to a compressive residual stress in the 90 degree ply in transverse direction. And therefore, the, uh, uh, this actually opposes the failure in the transverse tensile direction and therefore, there is an increase. Suppose, we would have made delta t is equal to minus 50, then what would have happened? Then in that case, the residual thermal stress uh, in, the, in the 90 degree layer would have been tensile and that would have been added and that would have led to reduced first ply failure load. You may try that putting delta t is equal to minus 50, what is the first ply failure load. Therefore, what we understand is that the residual thermal st stress does influence the first ply failure load. Similarly, we can also calculate the last ply failure load and we can see the influence of the residual thermal stress. In the same manner, we can also see how the residual hygroscopic stress also influences the first ply failure load. Okay. Now, it is not uh, I mean doing it manually is tedious therefore, you can just write a small code to determine the first ply failure load under only mechanical loading or under combined mechanical and thermal loading or under combined mechanical thermal and hygroscopic loading. Okay. So, I will stop here. Thank you.